rock. You have helped us to build our lives on faith in Jesus Christ. And thank you for your scriptures that have been opened wide to us to understand our salvation, to understand the greatest gift we will ever be given, freely given. We thank you for it, Lord. We bless you for it. And I pray tonight as we dig into your word and we chew on a piece of meat, (laughs) Romans is a piece of meat. I pray that you would just break it up into pieces that we can consume and take and be fed by. That you'd give us understanding by the power of your Holy Spirit. Our truest teacher, come and teach us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't be freaked out and worried about our homework and what we got done and what we didn't get done, but that we just relax tonight and have ears to hear from you. And that we'd be made available to love one another. Just come with your presence in a powerful way. We invite you here with all of our hearts. We pray that you'd make this time meaningful. Because we are centered and focused around Jesus. And it's his, in his name we pray. And those who agreed said, amen. Yay, it's so good to see you guys. Welcome back. Happy New Year. I hope you didn't make too many crazy resolutions. Just the good ones, like, I'm going to be in God's Word. (laughs) We're in Romans chapter 9, so you can turn there. I want to remind you that next week is a holiday break. So we won't be meeting, but we will be meeting the following week. We'll come back. So we'll have one week off, two weeks to do your homework, and then we'll be back again. So... I wanted to remind you that right off the bat. We are in Romans chapter 9. So far, as we have gone through Paul's letter to the church in Rome, we found that it is full of exquisite declarations of truth concerning our salvation, isn't it? We've learned that Christ died for all men, that his death on the cross was for whosoever who would believe. We've learned that our salvation is not based on works. It's not based on keeping the law. It's not based on our performance. Else we would fail. Else we would never get to heaven. Thank you, Jesus. It's based on faith. When we believe in Jesus Christ's death on the cross for our salvation and his resurrection from the dead, it triggers the grace of God to be poured over our lives past present and future for our forgiveness it covers our sin we've learned that now that we are saved now that we have believed in jesus christ god is sanctifying us he's setting us apart more and more for his purpose for his holiness we may have a giant struggle we've learned inside of our stuff ourself that flesh always trying to struggle and pull us away from the lord but the holy spirit gives us victory over our sin as we walk in the Holy Spirit, as we unite in intimacy with him, we get victory. It's all about relationship. Last time we met, we talked about Romans chapter 8, and we were left at the summit of glory. We were reassured that nothing Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, in chapter 9 through 11, in these next few chapters we're about to go through, Paul is going to change his tone. He's aiming at another topic. He's been going at this topic, but he's going to get more specific. His attention turns toward the Jews. Remember, he's writing a letter, and there's a lot of Jews within this church that he's writing to, and he's trying to communicate important truths to them, important truths. And there are truths that he wants us to know. That's why this book was left for us. Sometimes we think, how do we relate? It's important that we understand these things so that when we share the gospel, we're getting the gospel right, but so that we absorb the gospel in truth too, so that we know why we're saved and how we're saved. And it's not based on anything that is not truth. So Paul turns his attention to talk to the Jews about the promised Messiah and the rejection of the Messiah. And ultimately... In in time, maybe not in this chapter, but the ultimate restoration of the Jews. So we're in verse 1. 
We're going to read verses 1 through 3. I tell you the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh. Paul aligns himself once again and reminds the readers, I myself am Jewish. What I'm about to say came to me first, and now I'm sharing it with you. I'm not separate from you. I'm with you in this. In fact, I love you so much, so much, I'm delivering the very truth to you. As Paul tells them the truth of the gospel, it's like he draws a line in the sand and says, on this side is truth and salvation. On that side is a deception and will lead you to hell. And he's saying, cross the line. Come over here and receive your salvation. But Paul was so wise in his heart and so full of love. He didn't just speak the truth, but he spoke it in love. And he bore his heart to them. He's saying, I would be accursed. I so want my fellow Jews to be saved. I would be willing to forsake my salvation that they could inherit it. And that is a great lesson for all of us. The gospel is a challenging message to give. We can give it as a debate. We can give it as an argument. We can give it as a slap in the face. We can give it as a judgment. There's a lot of ways to approach people with the gospel. Paul's approach, though it's full of truth, it's, it's truth, he bears his heart because it's his love. He wants them to know that. Now, we just had Christmas, and I have to say that the most enticing gifts that I receive are the ones that are wrapped so beautifully. I mean, some people just have a gift with that, you know? And they just, they just do go elaborate and sparkly and shiny, and they just make it so beautiful, like you're like, oh, I just can't wait to dig into whatever is inside this packaging. And Paul had a gift, the best gift ever, and it was the gospel of Jesus Christ but he had the best packaging, love, deep, deep love. And that's what the gospel is best packaged in. Consider that. Who's on your heart? Who do you want to win to the Lord? Who do you want to share the gospel with? Who's the first person that comes to mind? I don't want them to go to hell. Love. You have to say the truth. You have to share the gospel. Without that, they can't be saved. But how are you presenting it? Is it in deep love? Is it an acts of kindness? Is it with a listening ear? Is it with a second chance or forgiveness? Is it with time spent? Is it with prayer on your knees over them? The gospel is best packaged in love. Now, let's go on to verses 4 and 5. Who are Israelites? Again, he's speaking of the Jews, the, uh, those from Israel, to whom pertain the adoption the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are all of whom the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Paul saying, I'm speaking to the Jews, and he lists seven historic privileges that the Jews of Israel had been given. Number one, they were adopted. They were blessed with sonship to God. Number two, they were given the glory. The glory they are speaking of the divine presence of God that accompanied them throughout their wanderings in the wilderness. Remember that God came and, and led them with the clouds and in the daytime and a pillar of fire at night. His presence went with them in such a special way. And then his presence came to them in the ark. So God blessed them with the glory, with his presence. And they were blessed with covenants, very particular and various promises made to them specifically by God. And they were given the law according to Moses. They were privileged among all men to be able to serve in the temple and handle the things of God. They were given many precious promises 
to them through their leaders prophetically. And lastly, lastly, and most importantly, Christ the Messiah, whose human lineage was passed through the Jews. And of course, we have to note verse 5. Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Do you have that highlighted and underlined in your Bible? Because girls, you've just seen a passage of scripture that says, Jesus is God. Can you say it with me? Jesus is God. That's in such an important verse to be able to take out and show others who do not believe this. It's a proof that he is the Godhead. So as you look at this amazing spiritual legacy that was given to Israel, it really makes Israel's unbelief all the more problematic, doesn't it? Because they were given everything to understand and be prepared to know that the Messiah was going to come and who the Messiah would be. And yet, they stubbornly rejected their Messiah. So Paul strongly warns them, verse 6. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor, all, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac you, your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For those, uh, for the, this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. God makes a distinction, distinct promises throughout the life of Israel. Promises to bring them to salvation. Promises of heaven. These wonderful, hopeful promises and it would come through them. Paul begins to clarify the promises so that they could fully understand what these promises were meant. And he distinguishes through his teaching here between the physical descendants of Abraham, those that are born Jews because of their heritage, right, their ancestry, and those that are the children of promise. And he's going to explain the difference. The children of the flesh refer to the descendants of Abraham. Just like I said, the children of promise are those that are born of faith. And he, he uses the example of Abraham and Sarah and their son Isaac to explain this. Verse 9, for this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. He was a promised son, Isaac was. He was the son of faith. Do you remember that Abraham and Isaac, Abraham and Isaac. Abraham and Sarah were given this great promise that you will have many descendants and I'm going to give you a son, even though they were past the childbearing years. It was an impossibility. But God was saying, I'm going to perform a miracle. But the miracle didn't come and the miracle didn't come. So they're like, what can we do to make this miracle happen? <laughs> How can I help God? Have you ever tried to help God? How can I get in there and make this happen? <laughs> we do that sometimes. That's that work of the flesh. They did a work of the flesh. And Sarah said, hey, go into my maidservant. Maybe God will bless us with our child through our maidservant. And Abraham's like, hmm, okay. No, <laughs> okay, I'm adding that to the Bible. But, you know, he was willing, and he did. And a child was born, and it was Ishmael. But you know that God did not bless that child as a child of promise. Just because they tried to work it out didn't mean he had a stamp of approval. And in Genesis 17... Verses 18 and 19, uh, it says, And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. In other words, Oh, that he might be the descendant of promise. Don't reject him. And God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear a son, and you shall conceive, and his name will be called Isaac. I shall establish my covenant with him and for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. Now, Paul notes also Genesis 21, 12, for Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Ishmael was a work of the flesh. Isaac was a work of faith. They had to wait on God, and they had to have faith that he would keep his word and provide this child in, their, in this barren womb. And as they waited in faith, God was true to his word. So Isaac was a child of promise. Do you see the lesson that is here? 
It's not a work of the flesh that will save us. It's not the keeping of the law or the ordinances or the sacrifices that will save us, those works of the flesh to earn your salvation. It's in faith, faith in the Messiah who is Jesus Christ. Galatians 4, verses 21 through 24 says, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. We understand the symbolism of the work of the flesh and trying to get saved through earning it or meriting it and through the work of faith by believing in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. As God chose Isaac rather than Ishmael, so also does he now choose to bless those who put their faith in the true Messiah. And those are the true children of Abraham. The children of promise are the ones who believe in Jesus Christ. Verse 5 says, For they are not all Israel who are of Israel, they are not all Israel who are of Israel. The name Israel is very telling. It was a name given to Jacob when he was born, and he wrestled in the womb with his brother, his twin brother. And as his brother came out first, he grabbed his heel. Oh, he wanted to be number one from the womb. <laughs> he grabbed his heel. And so his name was heel catcher, Jacob. The word heel catcher means to be a, a usurper of authority usurper of authority and it spoke of his character as you read the story of his life he was one who always took matters in his hands he was the boss he didn't have he, he cheat steal what he connived he did what he had to do to get what he wanted and he usurped authority especially god's but that day that he wrestled with that special being which we know was incarnate jesus christ at that time when he finally surrendered and broke, he was given a new name, and that name is Israel. Israel. That name means one governed by God. Oh, what a difference. To be one who usurps authority, to become one who is governed by God. A true Christian is one who by faith has yielded to the lordship of Jesus Christ. But the point here is this. No one is born with the right to be called the child of God. Just because you have the lineage of Jewishness about you, that you were born a Jew, doesn't give you the right to be called a child of God. You're not a child of God because you kept the law or some moral code. You're not a child of God because of your parents and that they were Christians before you. You're not a child of God because of someone else's greatest desire for you. You're not a child of God because you were born in America. You're not a child of God because you go to church. You are a child of God because you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, period. John 1, 11 through 13, he came to his own, the Jews, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believed in his name, who were born not of blood, heritage, right? Not of the will of the flesh, anybody wills it and desires it for you, no. Nor of the will of man, I just want it, that's enough, no. But of God, we must be born of God by faith. So who are the promised children this passage speaks of? Those who are born into God's family by faith in Christ. Now, Paul relates another example, verse 10 through 13. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. And as it is written, Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated. Now, Paul is making a case here that historically, God has chosen or selected different people groups 
to love and to favor, as was Israel. He did select them as a people to pour out his grace and his mercy and his goodness. That's why we went through that list of seven things that he had done for them. So Paul quotes Malachi 1, verses 2 and 3. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. This was written long after their birth. It wasn't a prophetic word. It was written after their birth and after their lives had been spent. And Malachi isn't speaking truly directly of Jacob and Esau. God hated one and loved the other. He's actually speaking of the people groups that came from them, the people groups that came out of their lineage. Esau brought forth the Edomites. The Edomites were wicked people, rebellious people, enemies of Israel. But from Jacob came the nation Israel. God loved one, he hated the other. He loved the nation of faith. He rejected the nation who rejected him. So keep this in mind when it comes to God's election. So important to understand that God does choose people. God knows all things from the beginning. All things from the beginning. And as we look back at Romans 8, 29, it says it so well. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. His election is based on his foreknowledge of us. He knows who, is, who will be his. He knows what our will and what our decision will be in the long run of our life. He knew Esau would be a man of the flesh while Jacob would be, be a man of the faith. Jacob was accepted because of his belief. Esau was rejected because of his unbelief. God loves all people. He didn't create some to reject them. He didn't create others to glorify them. He created all. He died for all, Jesus did, for all. But he knows who are his because he knows what our will will be, what our decision will be in the long run. He loves everyone equally. He invites everyone to salvation equally. And that's his desire, that no one should perish. No one. That's his greatest desire. The Jews as a nation were one of those people that God had put a special blessing. He set his love on them. He had elected them to be under his special care. Deuteronomy 7, 6 says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people's, his treasured possession. So Paul's not uh, trying to say God doesn't love you anymore. You were his chosen people, but you're not anymore. He continues to love every Jewish person. But he requires them in the same way he requires everyone to believe by faith in Jesus Christ. He selected them to be bearers of the word of God. He selected them to have the Messiah come through the entire world. They were meant to be a light to the entire world of people that through them, the blessing of the knowledge of God and the word of God would come through them. But the, the Jews grew proud. We're chosen. We're special. We're selected, and you are not. And they didn't want to shine the light. They didn't want to open up the doors for others to know their God. So that the privilege that they had by being chosen by him made their religion strong, but their mission very weak. This letter to the Jews is meant to bring understanding to them that God had expanded his privilege. It wasn't just to them anymore. It was to every other person, every other people group, everyone, that he, his love is set on the entire world, Jew and Gentile alike. Verse 14 says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Paul, as he's writing this, it's as if he's in the room with them and he's anticipating you know, what they might say if they were face to face, because this is a letter, right? So he's like sort of having an argument with himself almost, but he anticipates what they might say, what their objections might be, and he's beginning to answer that. 
Is God not guilty of injustice if he accepts one and the other is rejected? If, if he chooses Jacob, is that unfair of God to not choose Esau? I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I have compassion. It's a quote from Exodus 33, 19, where Moses has that beautiful, intimate conversation with God. When, that moment when he says, show me your glory, that's part of this conversation. God makes his sovereignty clear. He has the right to rule and reign as he pleases. Now, mercy... Do you all know what that means? The simplest version, not getting what you deserve. Mercy is simply not getting what you deserve. It's, it means that punishment that you deserve passes over you because of the kindness of that other party, right? Have you ever just, someone just did you wrong, <laughs> so wrong, and you just want to punish them in some way? withhold your friendship, your kindness, your help, whatever it might be, but then your heart's just touched for them. Compassion just swallows you up and like, oh, I'm not even going to hold this against them. I'm not even going to put this to their charge. I'm just going to forgive them. And I'm going to not only forgive them, but show them kindness. That's mercy, right? That's compassion and mercy. They deserved their punishment they didn't deserve a blessing, but mercy passes over the judgment and blesses. Now, if it is mercy, if it is mercy, then we know that that's the heart of God for all of us. His heart is mercy. Is it unfair if God didn't show mercy? If sin deserves punishment, is it unfair of God if he didn't show mercy? No. Mercy is not owed. It's not a right. We kind of think it is. I think everybody that doesn't know the Lord figures, I should go to heaven because God just should show me mercy. But if God were not to ever show any person mercy, he would not be unjust because mercy is not deserved. But we have a God of mercy. We have a God of compassion, and it is his nature. He loves to forgive. But if mercy were obligated, it would be no longer mercy at all. What a heart of God we have. Let's continue about this topic. Verse 16. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scriptures say of Pharaoh, or to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. God's election rests not upon human will, not upon human effort. It's his own divine work. <clears throat> Isn't it reassuring to know that he loves to be merciful and kind? It's his great joy to sovereignly give mercy on his sovereign terms, on his sovereign terms. In other words, we must believe in Jesus by faith to receive that mercy. God, uh, Paul gives an example here of how God shows his sovereignty in the life of one man, and that's through the Pharaoh of Egypt, the Pharaoh of Egypt. By the way, the Pharaoh of Egypt was not only like the king there, but he was worshipped as a god, and he demanded worship as a god. Did you realize that? That was part of what Pharaoh did. He was worshipped and idolized. Now, in this response to God being active in Pharaoh's life was a hardness of heart. The Pharaoh had a hard heart. Although God had sent messenger to him, a special messenger, his name was Moses, <laughs> and appealed to him, let my people go. Repent of what you've done by holding them in captivity and let my people go. He hardened his heart. Not only did he send messenger, but that messenger came over and over and over, didn't he? Moses went again and again and again to Pharaoh saying, let my people go. Repent of this and turn them over to me. But not only that, but God, out of his mercy, 
sent signs and wonders that were inexplicable and crazy and powerful and amazing through the plagues. Impossible. But God did it. He revealed himself in such a powerful way. And yet, each and every time, the Pharaoh hardened his heart. It's redundant in Scripture how many times God revealed himself to the Pharaoh. You would think the Pharaoh would go, this is the true and living God. This is him. He is active. He's alive. He didn't. His heart was never softened through any of the messages or any of the signs and wonders he saw. He was hardened and hardened. In Scripture, many times it says that his heart was hard. I'm just going to give one for time's sake. Exodus 8, verse 19. Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, his own magicians are telling him this, this is the finger of God. You know, no man can do what's happening right now. Even his magician said, this is the hand of God. But Pharaoh grew hard. His heart grew hard, and he did not heed them just as the Lord had said he would do. He had the opportunity to recognize God as God, repent, and even set things right, but he refused to do it. But as we read the passage and we see the, his heart growing harder and harder and Scripture stating it, as you go along, then it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Exodus 9, 12 says, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said to Moses. In Exodus 14, it says, The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. Right to the end. He was chasing after the sons of Israel. Right to the end. Verse 17 tells us that for this purpose, Pharaoh was raised up. Understand, God did not create Pharaoh or any person to intentionally harden their heart. But God knew in his foreknowledge, he knew in his foreknowledge that Pharaoh's heart would be hard and unrepentant. His hardness toward God was just his own natural sinful disposition. It was a choice, it was a decision that he made for himself. And there came that point in time that God said, I will not use my influence to persuade you any longer. That's the moment that it says God hardened his heart. It was already his heart. God just lifted his hand to influence him and let him grow harder and harder. You know, there's that moment where the Bible talks about the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. When you reject and reject and reject all of God's advances and approaches and messages and, and signs and the way he's reaching out to you, and you know, no, no, people get so hard that they blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And that's the only sin that can't be forgiven. And what is that? It's the absolute rejection of the Holy Spirit, the absolute rejection of his work. And that's that place that Pharaoh was. The interesting thing is, is God's saying that through the hardness of Pharaoh's heart, it created a backdrop, a dark, miserable, challenging, futile, impossible backdrop for Israel to be free. And it got harder and harder. It's like a diamond. You know how a diamond is best shown when you put it in that little black case? Woo, sparkle, right? It just shows off its brilliance. Well, what God is saying is that through the hardness of his heart, his own heart, I was all the more glorified. It dramatized my glory for all to see that I am a powerful and magnificent God because they, he tried to make it impossible. I showed you what I could accomplish. And that's what this passage right in this portion is trying to get at. God used him in the end that he, God himself, might get all the more glory. What is Paul's warning to his fellow Jews? What is his warning to all of us? Do not continue to harden your heart as Pharaoh did, lest the opportunity for salvation pass you by. If you haven't committed your heart to Jesus Christ, if you haven't believed by faith in Jesus Christ, if you're still trying to figure it out or you're still trying to merit it yourself, God just saying, no, lay that aside. Just believe in Jesus who died in your place. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Mark 8. Most of us here are believers for sure. We have put our faith in Christ. Thank you, Lord. 
But we do want to be warned about hardness of heart. Not in the sense that you'll lose your salvation, but it's just living in a world that's hard. Living in a body of flesh that can grow a hard heart very, very fast. And that's something to be greatly concerned about for every one of us. Even myself, I go through these times where I can feel it. I mean, I can feel that, you know, I don't want to go your way. I'm not, I don't want to do what you're asking me to do. It's too hard, or, not, or sometimes I just don't want to because I'm just not willing. There's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons. The word hardness here is literally defined as stubborn and obstinate. <laughs> Think about that. Is your heart hard? Are you digging your heels and are you being stubborn and obstinate about going God's way? being obedient to what he's calling you to do. Even if it's the smallest thing, he puts his finger on it and says, that's the thing. That's where I want you to push through and obey me. Because when we don't, the heart gets harder. Another way our heart gets harder is distance in, in fellowship and relationship with God. Just like with a person, when, when we aren't spending that intimate time with them and hanging out and loving on each other, like there's a distance, right? And we can kind of get hard. The more time I spend with the hus my husband, the more it melts my heart. The more I want to please him. The more I want to bless him. I know he feels just the same way, huh, honey? <laughs> but I'm serious. It just, it just, we just had three weeks of vacation, man. It was awesome. It was sweet. That was good for us to have. Because, you know, how work is and busyness is and even serving the Lord. It was sweet for us. And I see that in our relationship with the Lord. We need the time with him. And our hearts grow distant and harder when we're not in fellowship with him. And sometimes, you know, hardness of heart happens because of hurt. When we get hurt, man, the wall goes up. What do you think a wall is? It's hardness of heart. It's no, I'm distancing myself from that person. I'm distancing myself from that situation. And sometimes when we really work it through, we realize, hmm, I'm blaming God for this. <laughs> Because he's the bottom line every time, isn't he? He's the bottom line every time. And we can't help but have to go to him and go, okay, you've allowed this. You've allowed it. Help me. Because my heart is hard, and I don't want to go a step further. Right? Yeah, hardness of heart. Hardness of heart is hard to penetrate. It's very difficult to mold, and it's also difficult to break. And girls... Just the condition of a broken heart is beauty in the sight of God. It's beautiful. He loves and cherishes our softness. And by the Holy Spirit, he wants to make us softer and softer. By walking with the Holy Spirit, we grow a softer, more yielded, more willing, more moldable heart. Are you hard? Have you gotten tough in a way that God wouldn't be pleased about? God had been telling me I've got to, you know, I've got to be like a soldier. And there's some ways I've got to toughen up spiritually, right? But not in the hardness of heart department. <laughs> no, that part does not please him. Now, material scientists have been researching to discover what might best be useful in cleaning up the 2 million gallons of oil that petroleum that was spilt in the Gulf of Mexico. They're researching how, what can we do? What can we develop? How can we deal with this? And what they discovered works best to absorb it is cotton. Something God grew, cotton, cotton. The fibers within the cotton just suck that oil right up. And it's interesting because, of course, with their microscopes, they look into the cotton. What they found is that there's channels all inside, like we can't see that, but there's channels inside natural cotton that are meant to absorb. And it, it, as they use it, it's the best technique they found to absorb that oil. You know, the Holy Spirit is often described like oil. And I really believe that inwardly, spiritually, we have these channels that are meant to be absorbing the Holy Spirit, his person, right? Right? They're inside of us. Girls, maybe it's time just to invite the Holy Spirit again to come. Fill me. Fill every channel inside of me with more of you. Make me soft so you can mold me. Help me because I'm hard and I don't want to go your way. 
we got to pray honest prayers. Fill me, Holy Spirit, that I could be led by you, that I could be used by you. You know the Holy Spirit is the, is the communicator of the things of God? We need the Holy Spirit. So invite him. Invite him in. Like Hebrews 3, 7 says, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts. As in the day of the rebellion, when they were wandering in the wilderness, they always dug their heels in. Do not harden your heart. Vance Vag Vavner wrote this, God uses broken things. He takes broken soil, or it takes broken soil to produce a crop, broken clouds to give rain, broken grain to give bread, broken bread to give strength. It is the broken alabaster box that gives for, uh, forth perfume. It is Peter weeping bitterly who returns to greater power than ever. We don't like to be broken because it's vulnerable. That's a hard feeling to feel broken before the Lord. But it's when we're broken that God can do his best work. And that brokenness is the opposite of hardness. So I pray for myself and I pray for you that we'll let the Holy Spirit do a fresh work. Verse 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against the Lord? Will the thing form say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have the power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and the other for dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? I think that describes Pharaoh perfectly right there. He endured and endured and endured with him, giving him opportunity after opportunity, but he did not repent. And so in the end, he used him to get himself glory. He made him his own power known through the hardness of Pharaoh, verse 23, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but of the Gentiles, but also of the Gentiles. The question that comes, and it's being answered here, as Paul's having this argument on paper, if God is sovereign, and elects some and not others, do I escape responsibility for my sin? I mean, I'm born this way. If I wasn't elected and chosen, well, then how can I be responsible, held responsible for my sin? Do I escape that responsibility over my decisions concerning salvation? We see two important points here. Number one, God is sovereign. He used the illustration from Isaiah 29, 16, and also... Um, Isaiah 45, 9, with that picturing the absurdity of the clay questioning the potter who is forming and creating it, making the lump into whatever he wants it to be. And Paul concludes that God is sovereign and has the right to do with his creation as he pleases. But number two, man still has responsibility. Man will be held accountable. He actually said, how dare you even question God? You have no right to question God that way. He will be held accountable for his choices. God will not be to blame for their lack of judgment or irresponsible behavior or immoral lifestyle, nor their rejection of Jesus Christ. Because as much as God has elected us, we have a free will. God has given every man, every woman, a free will to determine for themselves if they will believe or not. And that has never been taken away from us. So they will be held accountable on Judgment Day. All of us will, both Jew and Gentile. God points out that in his, or Paul points out in God's mercy and God's long suffering, he's given us over 2,000 years right now since Christ died. Judgment Day could have come. But you know, God extends it and extends judgment day so more can come. Do you understand that that's the mercy of God to all mankind? More time, more opportunity for us to share the gospel with them, for him to reach them. He is a God of mercy. 
Verse 25, as he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, through the number of the children of Israel, be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. He will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because the Lord will make short work upon the earth. And as Israel said before, unless the Lord of the Sabbath had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. In all of Israel's entire history, of all the plotted annihilations that have come against them, which we can think of the book of Esther, but there's been so many, you know, over the history that we know of. Like, it's very, we're very aware of that annihilation. God has always preserved a remnant of Jews. They have not been wiped out. Furthermore, when Israel themselves sinned against God, when they went against him and wanted to serve false gods, he put them in the, the situation of being um, held captive. You know, even in Babylon, they were held captive. But even then, when they deserved to be wiped out for their sin, there was always a remnant of faith of those who continued to believe in their God. And that's why it says in Isaiah 1.19, unless the Lord of hosts had left us a few survivors, we would have been like Sodom and we would have been like Gomorrah. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? They were judged for their sin and they were wiped out for it. They were wicked people and he said, I'm, I've had enough. And that could have been Israel, except for the grace and mercy of God, his love and favor to them. He didn't give them what they, what they deserved. He always spared them and saved a remnant of faith. He continues to uh, preserve Israel. He continues to do that work as some are coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and receiving them as their Savior. Verse 30 says, What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of defense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. The Gentiles sought their righteousness, he's saying, in faith through Jesus Christ. And because they have sought Jesus Christ for their salvation, they have obtained it. The Jews, on the other hand, seek their righteousness through keeping of the law. And they have fallen short and have not obtained it. They stumbled. They stumbled over a stumbling stone. And his name was Jesus Christ. God will hold them responsible for that decision. The good news is, whether you are Jew or Gentile, whoever believes on the name of Jesus Christ, will not be put to shame. Let's pray. Father God, again, I pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us and just grant us more in-depth understanding of this passage, of this wonderful call you've put on our life as believers. I pray, God, that, that we would just Rejoice in the awesome work of your son at the cross and rejoice in our salvation. And that, Lord, it would spur us on to walk more closely with you than ever. Oh, Lord, if we're wandering, if we're hardened, if we're not listening, if we're not obeying, would you call us back? Would you fill us with the Holy Spirit, every channel inside of our being? And just help us to fall in love with you again. Lord, we don't want to serve you out of a duty. We don't want to know you out of a duty. We want it to be out of love. So we invite Only your work in our heart and life. We just worship you now. We worship you together. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Lord, it's your love that